Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning. ma'am. Good morning. The recording is started. Yeah. Today we will continue on the same book of Samuel, the second part of his, which has been called in our Bible as Second Samuel. Before we could before we could begin our class, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Rebecca, can you lead us in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Glory Master. Oh, Father, you have given the wonderful time to spend with your uh, children, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray uh, for your good session that you have uh, uh, that you have given, Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us and guide us to walk in your uh, birth, Lord Jesus. My Father, Holy Spirit, you guide us, your children, Lord Jesus. You are the mighty Father that you do do a lord jesus mighty things in your children's life lord jesus yes father these sessions we are give to you in your hand lord jesus and your presence we want lord jesus my father help our teachers to teach uh, very well in this uh, words for Jesus. Jesus, you are the good Lord Jesus, my Father. You are hearing our prayer. Uh, yes, Father, you are the mighty Lord Jesus, my God. I pray in the precious name of Jesus, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just present the notes. So let's turn to Second Samuel from our notes. The author of Second Samuel is the same as the first Samuel, where Samuel wrote the first 24 chapters of First Samuel, and then later part of the book has been written by the prophet uh, uh, Prophet Gad and Dan. And then uh, the date of this book is uh, it is David reigned for 40 years. Okay, the first seven and a half years he reigned over Judah uh, from 1011 BC to 1004 BC. And later part, he also unites Judah and Israel from 1004 BC to 971 BC. The very purpose of this book, we see that while judges showed Israel needs a king. And in the book of Samuel, we see David uh, who was chosen by God to be the king and how God led uh, David and how God gave him the victory. Every battle that he fought, God blessed him. And in 2 Samuel, we see that God blesses uh, the king David because he chose him and how David obeys and inquires uh, everything with God and he has been led by God. And we also see David's successor needed to be reminded of the prophetic viewpoint. To obey to God brings reward and disobe disobedience bring its punishment. And this clearly has been illustrated as God's blessing for David's obedience and punishment for his sin. And uh, the, we also see the unique features. The second Samuel records the establishment of Jerusalem at God's holy city. The next we see the law of sowing and reaping is no way more clearly illustrated than in the tragic of results of David's sin with Bathsheba. And First uh, Samuel records the anointing of David as king by Samuel in the presence of his family. And in Second Samuel we see uh, records the two public anointing of David as king by the people of Judah and then by all the twelve tribes as the king of Israel. In Second Samuel introduce the second of the uh, three most important Old Testament unconditional covenant, which is called as the Davidic covenant. The other two are the Abrahamic covenant, which we saw in the book of Genesis, and the new covenant, which we will see much later in the book of Jeremiah when we study. 
comparison of this book with the other is with Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, where while David fought to keep Israel's 12 tribes together, the Messiah foretold in Ezekiel will find no disunity among the tribes. Both book discuss of preparation for a temple, David for Solomon's temple and Ezekiel for the millennial temple. Some of the major events which we see in the book of Second Samuel is David becomes the king over Judah and then later over Jerusalem. David is Davidic is unveiled the promise that his throne would be established forever in an eternal kingdom. We see again David's covenant involves three things. One, the house dynasty established forever, the eternal kingdom throne over throne established forever and then we see Christ's eternal rule will be fulfilled with the Davidic covenant and uh, next point we see David's been troubled because uh, he had sinned with Bathsheba and uh, David uh, pays fourfold he lost the son then he loses Tamar then Amnon and Absalom continuously and David's Trouble in the nation. Uh, Sheba and the Benjamite revolt. Three years famine due to Saul's sin against the Gibeonites. The numbering of the people. Pride involved and you know he stopped doing that. He stopped getting involved in the numbering of the people. As a result 70,000 people die. And we also see the outline. David the sovereign as a sinner and how he suffered the straight man singer and the portrayal of the shadow of Christ in this book as seen in the first Samuel David is one of the most important type of Christ in the Old Testament in spite of his sin he remains as a man after God's own heart because of his responsive and faithful attitude towards God. He humbled himself despite the wrong what he did and he went before God with a repented heart. And when he repents, we see God forgiving him and keeping up the covenant. God establishes the covenant that he did with David. And through him, he, uh, he promises the lineage of Messiah will come through the David's lineage. For this, we will uh, we will open our Bibles. In the meanwhile, I'll just share the presentation what I've prepared. Yeah, I felt this picture is more apt for David. You know, who pleases God with the Psalms, who, who, who desires to sing and praise to God always. So as we move on to our Bible study, okay, let's turn to Second Samuel chapter 1 onwards so yesterday we studied on the book of first samuel as we know both the book are the same it was in the later part when they were doing the Septu uh, septuagint or the translation in greek is when they separated this one book of uh, samuel into two parts first samuel and second samuel so in second samuel we'll see the story of david reign as a king over Israel. So there's a season of a success and blessing and later part of the same book we see uh, the huge moral value failure and sad consequences of a sin. Um, yeah, let's turn to chapter 1 from 1st Samuel. Sorry, 2nd Samuel chapter 1. Here we see the death of Saul and uh, David surprises everyone. Uh, they thought uh, David will be pleased with death of Saul when the two men ran and came to David, uh, you know, uh, uh, tearing their clothes and the dust on their head. Uh, so looking at them itself, David knew there is a bad news because uh, that was the uh, portrayal of something, uh, a person who's carrying a bad news. So these two men who carried this news to David saying that Saul and his three sons are dead in the battle David lamented over them David wept 
wept and wept. He was not very happy about Saul's death, the man who sought to kill David. But then he lamented because he was God's anointed. And he also wept for his son, Jonathan, Saul's son, Jonathan, who was a very good friend of David. So once again, we see how uh, David is, uh, David is, uh, how David is moved with compassion, and he is a man who grieves, uh, grieves for his, um, for the death of his own enemy, who is chasing after his life, and also he grieves for his best friend Jonathan. And after that, uh, in chapter two to six, chapter two, okay, chapter two, we see that David experiences a season of success and uh, God's blessing over him. All of Israel tribes uh, of, uh, you know, uh, before that we see how uh, David inquires with God. He inquires saying that in chapter two, verse one, we see that uh, David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? Instead of David choosing by himself, he actually seeks God. God, can I move? To Judah. And here God clearly directs David saying that, yes, you can go up to and go to Hebron. God is directing in the right place. And David obeys to God's command and he moves with his family to Hebron. When he goes to Hebron, there you see a verse 4, second chapter, verse 4. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. The men of Judah, they came approaching David, and they said, we would like to appoint you as a king over Judah. Now David has become uh, the king of Judah, and then he rules over them for seven and a half years. And after that, uh, you know, uh, the army, Abner was cousin of King Saul, and he was also the chief commander uh, in uh, Saul's army, in Saul's kingdom. So Abner uh, appoints Isho Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth was the fourth son of Saul. He appoints him as the king over the king over Israel, and and later we see uh, during a war um, with the other kingdom. Uh, they kill Abner in this war, and they also go ahead chasing Ishabot, and they also kill him in his house. And uh, the two men, uh, after killing them, bring a uh, news to David, saying that you know they think again that David would be happy hearing that Saul, fourth son, has also been killed in the war. But then David was very sad and he also executes these two men who killed Ishabot. And now again, all the other 12 tribes of Israel come to David and say, can you become the king over us? Now we see the promise of David saying, David, I will appoint you as the king of Israel. We see how Samuel anointed David as the king of Israel being fulfilled in, in the book of 2 Samuel. People all of all the 12 tribes gathered together and be their king. And David takes over and David unites the kingdom of Judah along with Israel and rules them as a single kingdom. And now David has become the king of Israel. And then... Uh, Second Samuel chapter 7, we see that um, it is a key chapter for our understanding the storyline of the whole Bible because God here makes made a promise to David that he will be the royal line with the future king who is going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an eternal kingdom. Here we see the, uh, the king or the king of kings. Here we see the prophecy of the king of kings, that is Jesus who will come from the line of David. And it's this, the messianic promise to David that gets picked up and developed more in the book of Psalms and also in the other books of prophet. And it's this king that gets connected to God's 
promise to Abraham, the future Messianic kingdom will be how God brings his blessing to all the nations. And with this, we will move on to chapter 11. What happens in chapter 11? In midst of all these divine blessing, where uh, you know we see the rise in David, uh, in uh, in ruling over Israel, and we see the hand of God over David. Now, what happens when David was on the terrace? David makes a serious mistake. Sees Bathsheba, Uriah's wife bathing and he moves with lust and he takes her by force and sleeps with her and gets her pregnant and then David tries to cover that pregnancy by forcing Uriah, uh, Uriah to go into Bathsheba but he being the faithful servant he says no Lord when we are in the battle I cannot do that so because Uriah was very stubborn he sends him to the battle and he plans it such a way that Uriah is in the front line and gets killed very easily. By this, Uriah has been assassinated in that battle. And then later, David takes Bathsheba as his wife. And later part in chapter 12, we see the prophet Nathan confronts, confronts with a parable to David. Can one of us please read chapter 12, verse 1 onwards? The Lord sent Nathan, the Lord to... sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. Which he brought and which he bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had to come who had come to him. Rather he took the poor man's ear lamp and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Seventh verse. Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house and your mistress' wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like this. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. 11th verse, please continue. All right. Yeah. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives in the broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed, you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went to his house. Thank you. Thank you. You see, the heart condition of David 
you know, when Nathan, the prophet, confronted David, David turned to God and asked for forgiveness with a repented heart. And when he repented and asked forgiveness with God, God forgave him. So our heart condition is very important. And God was ready to forgive David for the sin that he did. But at the same time, he had to face the consequence of his sin. Where the, the child that Bathsheba conceived dies. And, uh, you know, uh, though David fasts and prays for the child to live, but then he loses this child as, you know, the consequences of his sin. And in chapter 13, we see that David's son and uh, uh, yeah, David's son end up repeating his own mistakes, but in uh, ever more tragic way. So Amnon sexually abuses his sister Tamar, and then their brother Absalom finds out what was done to Tamar by Amnon, and he kills Amnon, and then. You know, in, in chapter 15 to 18, we see Absalom becomes, ang uh, you know, he, 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 he's so angry about his father because he didn't take any reaction over Amnon uh, when his daughter was sexually abused. So now Absalom uh, plans a secret army. He plans, uh, he has a secret plan to go against his father, David, and uh, take the power from him. And, you know, he, he tries to chase David and tries to kill him. David, you know, he never, again, he never uh, tried to uh, talk to Absalom or try to correct their children, but then he flees from Absalom to save his life. And now he flees with his family. So again, he runs uh, to caves to cave and he's forced to flee because Absalom was trying to kill him and his family and he hides in the wilderness. And uh, except this time, last time when he was trying to run, he was very innocent, young man. David was a young man when he was trying to run away from Saul. But this time when he's running, he's not innocent. He is a king. He's a king of Israel. He has all the rights to face Absalom, but he is not. He's trying to run away. Um, but then what happens? Later we see uh, the rebellion ends when David's son is murdered. Again, uh, you know, uh, uh, secretly David's army comes and murders Absalom and it breaks David's heart. When David heard this, you know, he weeps, he tears his clothes, he puts the dust on his head and he weeps for his son and he says, Absalom, oh my son, Absalom, and he cries out. Uh, David in his last days finds back on his throne, but with a broken heart. He was a wounded, uh, wounded man with all the consequence that he had to face due to his sin. And in chapter 21 to 24, we see the book concludes with a well-crafted epilogue with stories that are out of chronicle order, chronological order. So the outer pair of the stories come from earlier in David's reign and they compare the failure of Saul and then of David and how each of them hurt other people through their bad decision. And we also see the next inner pair of the stories about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting against the Philistines. And what's interesting is that both the section have a story of David's weaknesses in the battle. So in contrast to the victorious David in the first few chapters in this book, uh, that is from first chapter one to chapter nine, and later part we see the vulnerable, vulnerable David who committed sin, and later chapters follows the consequences of his sin. He loses four sons four children of his and then he weeps over them and chapter 2 to uh, chapter 23 the first part we see the two poems that act like uh, memories and uh, David reflects back on his life and he remembers times when God was so graciously rescued him from danger and he sees these as the moments where God was faithful to his covenant promised to him.
and to his family uh, through both of these poems concluded by looking back on the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom and these poems then uh, you know then uh, uh, then portrays God's promises who connect back to Hannah's poem that opened the book in first Samuel which says the key passages from the beginning now the middle and the end of the book bring the same theme all together saying that you know sings about God's promises and eternal kingdom is through the coming king of kings and we see despite Saul and David's then God remained at work moving forward to his redemptive purpose. Though God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but he exalted David when he uh, repented for his sin and uh, when he repented and genuinely regarded over his sin and uh, revealed his repented heart towards God and Lord uh, forgave him we see lord forgave him and still god blessed him and his uh, family where god said i will bless you with a son and uh, that is solomon through him i will build the kingdom again and also uh, when uh, in 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 the coming book we will see how david desires to build a temple because now they are uh, they are dwelling in uh, one place Okay, one place and David, we see in the coming book, David desires to build a temple for God. But then God says, not in your hands, because your hands has a lot of blood. But then your son Solomon will build a temple for me and I will give him the peace from the surrounding kingdom. So what is the big idea of this book? Second Samuel? We see the key verse of Second Samuel is in chapter 7 verse 16 can one of us please turn to second samuel chapter 7 verse 16 and read it second samuel chapter 7 verse 16 your house kingdom shall end forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is the promise that you know, God gives to David. And as God promised, we see that his promise has been fulfilled uh, through Jesus, because Jesus was from the descendant of David. Again and again, we read that throughout the book of prophets and also uh, in the New Testament, when the, uh, when the genealogy of Jesus is read, we see that uh, Jesus is from the David's descendants and they, and we also see in this book that David celebrates God's faithfulness in Psalms 89. Can we turn to Psalms 89, please? Okay. Psalms 89 also uh, explains uh, God's faithfulness over David and, you know, he pens out uh, the covenant. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips, he says. And once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendant shall endure forever and his throne as a sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witnesses in the sky is faithful. We read that in verse 34 to 37, Psalms 89, 34 to 37, that God's unconditional promise to David would be fulfilled ultimately in David's descendants through Jesus Christ. The covenant also included a continuing promise 
that the people of Israel would have a land of their own forever. So in this book, we can see uh, God called David as a man after his own heart. We, see, we saw that in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, when God anointed David, when David was a shepherd boy, God anoints him and tells Samuel, he is the man after my own heart. Though David sinned greatly and made a lot of mistakes, but he acknowledged those failures. David acknowledged those failures and he repented them before God. When we say repent, means to turn away from sin and turn towards God's righteousness. So our father knows, yes, we are not perfect. God knows David from inside out, even before God could anoint him as king. God knows his strength and his weaknesses. But God looks at him from his heart. Looks at his heart, his attitude, which truly desired to please God at all times. And so his son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price for our sins so that we can become righteous in God's sight through faith. And although our salvation is secured, our daily sins can hinder our relationship with God, just like how David. But when we confess our sins and repent with all our heart, and turn to God in all humility. And when we ask for forgiveness, a God is a God who forgives us and restores us back to the relationship with Him. Today, can we also, just like David, no matter how big a sin could be, but when we ask God to forgive our sins and repent with our heart, come before Him, with a repented heart, our God is ready to forgive us our sins and restore us back with a relationship saying, you are his son, you are his daughter, that we are his son and we are his daughter. And our relationship is once again restored back to God our Father. We also see in the, uh, in the book of James, James chapter 4 verse 10, it says, when we humble ourselves in the presence of God, acknowledging that God is great and He is above everything, above all our consequences. And when we ask God for forgiveness, God is ready to forgive and restore us back and exalt us. When we humble ourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt us in due season. So just like how David did, when we humble ourselves, despite our sinful nature, God will forgive us and restore us back. This is something that we could learn from David's life. At all time, David pleased God. He was truly a man after God's own heart. He had the heart like God. You know, he, he never killed uh, like uh, David, uh, he never killed Saul who was after him or David's uh, uh, David's son Absalom uh, who was uh, after David to kill him but even when they died he didn't rejoice over the death but then he grieved for them, he wept for them but one area we see that uh, David failed was in in correcting their son and disciplining their children. If he would have disciplined, Amnon would not have behaved in that way to his sister Tamar. And I'm sure even Absalom wouldn't have rebelled against his father and his kingdom. So, you know, this is something that we need to learn from David's, uh, you know, the strength and the weaknesses as well. So open to class, what are the other areas or uh, other things that you would like to add on? Please go ahead and add on to this book of 2 Samuel. What are the things that we can learn from First and 2 Samuel? 
and also one more point sorry I missed this out we also see uh, David bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem when he became the king and uh, he rejoiced welcoming the Ark of the Covenant he danced front of the Ark of the Covenant by welcoming and he made Jerusalem as the capital city and we also see some of the key events as David was anointed of King of Judah and Ishobot, the fourth son of Saul, became the king of Israel. And we saw David reign over all the Israel and God's covenant with David. And David sinned with Bathsheba and David had to, David sin of, uh, sin of numbering the people of Israel. And the highlights of this book is uh, the first Samuel records David's rise to power as Saul fell from God's favor. And in second Samuel, we see the story of David's kingship and the establishment of his royal line through which Jesus, the Messiah, will come. The book begins just before David's second anointing as king and ends shortly after his death. Nathan and Gad joined together, became an unknown author, wrote this book, which records the major events of David's rule. And this was written to give the history of Israel from Saul's death through David's reign. And this book also records the establishment of Jerusalem as God's holy city. The tragic results of David's sin with Bathsheba clearly illustrates the law of sowing and reaping. This book also introduces the second of the three most important of the Old Testament unconditional covenant, that is the Davidic covenant. And the reflection we have here is, we see this book starting with the triumphs of David, but after his sin with Bathsheba, we see a tragic turn in his life and in the life of the nation. Are we living our life knowing that our sin has consequence? Let's give a thought. Or are we aware that our sin will affect the people whom we are responsible for? If David had thought this, I'm sure he would have avoided many pitfalls in his life. I hope it, the next administer of the class to add a few points whatever we discussed or to share from first and second Samuel our learning from the life of King Saul and King David. Class, anyone can share what was your learning from this first two books? I mean, from this book of Samuel. Ma'am, can I share? Yes, Sid. Ma'am, the thing I liked in first Samuel chapter 14 was like how Jonathan, how Jonathan took the initiative of attacking the Philistines. He not thought that I am just a small kid. How can I face this much big army? He just went with a with a servant, his armor bearer, and he attacked the mighty army of Philistines. And God gave good, and God gave Jonathan all the Philistines to his hand. I like this verse that how he not thinking like I am a small child. Like as God told Jeremiah that you have to go, I will give words through your mouth. And in Jonathan's life, we can see that how God used a small child to conquer this much big army. I like this portion. Fourteen. Yes. Yes. Yes, even we see young David, I mean, fighting against the Goliath and God gave him the victory. So it's not how young or how experienced we are, but we have to depend on God and his power so that even though we may be young, we can do great and mighty things through God and his power. Thank you, Sid, for sharing that. That's an amazing lesson that each of us can learn. To depend on God and well comparison that with Jeremiah as well yeah anyone else
Divya, John, Nikki, Zeli Toli, Isaac. So one of the things. Jeffina, uh, just share your thoughts. Yeah. So one of the things which strikes my mind was when David was repenting. Um, we also see in Psalms fifty-one. Um, in verse four. Uh, we see against you only I have sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Um, so yeah. when we see the title of Psalms fifty one, we read uh, this is uh, a psalm which David wrote after Prophet Nathan came to him, and you know he got convinced and he is repenting. So yes. the attitude that David is having is that he has sinned against God, um, and that is one of the things which we can remember. in our walk with him yes yes yeah that's a beautiful psalm we see in verse 10 where he says create in me a clean heart of god and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast me away from your presence and do not take away your holy spirit so there was a genuine repentance from god and god honored him and forgave him yes anyone else ma'am david david was uh, chosen by the god and we said that he was elevated by the god then why he fall down in the sin okay anyone can answer rubika anyone in the class a question was though david was appointed by god and he was also inquiring with god then why did he commit sin was a question is that rubika yes ma'am yeah can anyone in the class good question so good question Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. I think that is uh, that see, Satan has no respect of any human being, no matter who you are. Still, you are in his sin. You are still in his center of focus. His arc of fire. He will. Uh, he will tempt you, and if you give in, you give in. No matter who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lubega. Lubega. Yes, please. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. great. Divya, you would like to Divya, add. Divya, you would like to add. Uh, I was uh, about to say another learning from both the books. Yeah. Um, can I add on to the point? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I really love about David is. Uh, how he shows uh, kindness to jonathan's son mephi mephi boshet mephi boshet yeah. yes in uh, chapter 9 uh, so yeah even though you know uh, saul had been uh, chasing and uh, creating a havoc for david uh, you know that kindness that he has towards uh, jonathan's son Uh, that is really commendable because he uh, wants to you know um, be compassionate so it shows his character a lot uh, yes yeah and that uh, that can be emulated in our lives as well Thank yes you. yes yes we see uh, you know uh, yes the kindness towards uh, mephi boshet was good uh, where you know uh, because of the friendship that david had with jonathan you know uh, not only uh, david blessed jonathan uh, uh, with uh, uh, he also gave him the place to have uh, uh, you know to dine with him on his table and he also gave him a part of his uh, portion as a blessing to him yeah we read that and you know uh, he took care of him because uh, he was a physically challenged person and uh, david took care of him he was under the shadow of david and to honor the friendship of jonathan yes 
anyone else would like to add on and Rebecca to answer to your question yes God knows and also God gives the free will uh, free will God knew that David will sin we are human okay we may we are not perfect except Jesus so Dave, uh, God knew David's weakness and still God appointed him as a king and still God called him as a man after his own heart um, because David was man after God's own heart even though he sinned he repented he repented and asked God for forgiveness uh, God is a holy God okay at the same time he's merciful so God in his mercy forgives him but David had to face the consequence of his sin where he lost four of his children. Did that answer your question, Rebecca? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add on to this book? Because yes. not all the instances we have covered but just like how said and David brought a new point I would appreciate even you all to bring up a new point yeah can I share a question yes please yes. Um, we all see that from the books God has already established that David was a man after his own heart so is it because of the love that God had for David that when, even when he committed a sin, and equally the first king, Saul, committed a sin. Sin is sin. There is no small sin. There is no big sin. Okay? Saul committed a sin. David also, as king, committed a sin. But God allowed him. He repented. God allowed him to stay onto the throne. But in the case of Saul, God did not allow him. I don't know whether he was he was not able to repent for his sin because he rebelled, and after that, God took the power away from him. Why 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 was that happening? Is it because of the love that God had for David, or because he knew how to repent for his sin? Thank you. Thank you. That is a very good question. Yes, both Saul and David sinned. Saul, see, a heart attitude is what matters. Again and again, we see in First Samuel, again and again, we see that God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance. So we may say sorry, but what is inside? What is our heart's intention? God knows. God looks at that. So... Saul, when he committed sin, he didn't repent genuinely in front of God. And later, again and again, he was sinning. Again and again, he went against God. But here we see David, when Nathan confronted him, he never asked sorry to Nathan, or he never asked Nathan, what should I do? But then he looks at God. He knew, he knew the sin that he committed was against God and he wept and cried in front of God the genuine repentance that comes from the heart is what God seeks and same thing God seeks with you and me today with us when we repent with a genuine heart God forgives us because is a God of mercy and love as you said the same thing in the New Testament we also see Judas betrayed Jesus and even Peter betrayed Jesus but Judas was guilty but he never repented but Peter wept and he repented again and again he repented and he cried out but still, God didn't take over the leadership from Peter. In fact, he restored it back in front of all the other disciples, saying, Peter, you take care of my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Three times he asked, and three times again and again, in front of all the other disciples, he restored the leadership what was appointed to Peter. The same way back to the book of Second Samuel, when David repented, 
God did not, did not take away the leadership from him or take away the Holy Spirit from him. He, in fact, David prays, Lord, create in me a clean heart. In Psalms 51, we read that. We just read it. Take not away thy Holy Spirit. So David knew the power of God. And he desired for more of God in him. God delighted in the heart that David had to worship him. Yes, he was weak with women. He, he sinned against God in that area but he asked for forgiveness but then he, he the love towards God was much more than anything we see how uh, David delights in the book of Psalm when we study we see like he continually says it's better for me to be in your courts than thousand days elsewhere for me it is good to be in your presence I need more of you that's why God called David as a man after my own heart. The heart that he had for God was much greater than anything. Did that answer your question, brother? Yes, uh, the answer is perfect, correct. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add to it? Yes, Pastor. Please. Can I say something? Please. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Number one, I in in when I read the book of First and Second Samuel, I do get some character about Jonathan. Jonathan had all the powers and with the support of his father to be the king. He chose not to do that. He chose to be supportive of God's will and he was supportive of David. So that means that not all of us can be leaders. At times we might be the people who are going to open a way or to, to sweep or to do something for the leader to pass through. So that means that Jonathan really saw the big picture and he left leadership as far as man is concerned to, Jonah, uh, to, to David. Number two, I also realize that it's not always good to, to jubilate or to jump on top of our, our feet when our enemy has got a problem. We see this happens when David himself sees that Saul has got issues, oh Saul is dead, but this guy kept his heart cool and kept it down and he was not jubilating just as other people would have done because this guy was looking for his own life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Devi also adds a point here. Uh, because of God's unconditional covenant with David, that he also was forgiven. Yes. Okay. Okay, we can end this class with a word of prayer. Can I request one of us to please end this class with a word of prayer? Nikki, you would like to pray? Sure, uh, I can pray. So, um, yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this class, Lord God. We thank you for all that we've learned, Lord God. And I just pray that as we study more of you, Lord, we just pray that we would also um, be like David, Lord. We'd be someone who's after your uh, your own heart, Lord. We just want more of you and we'll not be satisfied with what we have, Lord God. I just pray that you teach us, lead us, and uh, guide us, Lord, in the day to come. And I pray that you anoint us and use us and we may walk in your way, Lord. Lord. I pray this time we thank you for uh, Nancy also, Lord. We thank you for the blessing that she is and we thank you for the blessing that APC is for. We pray this in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. God bless.